tried to sing like back there. Woo. Who's glad to be in church? Yeah. Got some hands, got some voices, got some. It's good. Um, we're going to be starting with a little bit of recap for tonight. Um, I find that whether with whether you were with us in service the week before or not, if the messages kind of tie in together with the one from the week before, that sometimes it's good um, if we kind of get a little recap or get a little um, refresher on what was covered the week before. Because I don't know about you, but a lot can happen in the span of days that there are between midweek service and midweek service. Do the weeks ever feel long? <laughs> In between one Wednesday and the next Wednesday. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. Like even the little ones think so. Yeah. <laughs> so imagine what it's like for us older people. Um, but to jog your memory a little bit, in the message last week, I had encouraged you that it is important to know what you believe, okay, rather than to just fall back on statements like what? I believe what the Bible says. Or I believe what? Yes, my pastors preach. Yay, Ted was listening. Gold star. Man, I meant to bring gold star stickers today. I was cleaning in my office and I actually found like one little thing of gold star stickers. And I'm like, that would just be funny one day to bring like gold star stickers. And yeah, I forgot. You would have got a gold star sticker tonight. Um, but yes, we absolutely should believe what the Bible says. Yes, and we should believe what our pastors are preaching in church, right? In actuality, if we ever hope to be able to ward off being deceived by the enemy of our souls, though, the great deceiver himself, then we also need to be able to verbalize, right, what those beliefs actually are, okay? When Satan came and tempted Jesus when he was already in the wilderness, Jesus didn't go, but I believe what my father says. Did he? No. Satan said, doesn't scripture say? Da, 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 da. And Jesus didn't go. But yeah, I believe what my father says. And he says something that can rebuttal that. So there. I, saw, I felt like Brie right then. Like, doesn't that, that was like her attitude. So there. Yeah. No, he didn't say that. He said, but it is also written right? Yes. And so during our time together last week, I had challenged you to pen a few lines that could stand as your own creed of sorts, because we had looked at the Apostles' Creed, right? And to use it as your, that was used as the statement of belief, kind of, for the early church. And so I had kind of encouraged you to do the same thing, okay? And it was like homework for you to pen a few of your own I believe statements, Um because nothing will get you to start looking at just what is it that I do believe and does what I believe actually line up with scripture like penning your own I believe statements. And one of you, <clears throat> Matt, came home <laughs> that evening and posted yours on the Mercy Family page like almost immediately, okay? And I was very proud of him, and guess what? It was scripture-based, like everything about, he was just like boom, 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 boom. Like he had Old Testament in there, he had New Testament in there, he had Joel chapter two in there, he had I'm, a, I'm the head and not the tail in there. He had like scripture in there, okay? Um, gold star for Matt too. Like I would have been passing out gold stars tonight, okay? Someone else texted me theirs earlier today. Um, I was talking with somebody last night, and they said, oh, I just remembered about my homework. And I said, oh, I was going to put something on the Mercy Family page, and I didn't. And they said, yeah, you should probably do that, because you just reminded me, just because I was just talking to you, and it reminded you, reminded me, you should probably put a reminder on. And so I did today, earlier. I put something on there. Um, and a few of you handed them to me as we walked in. I think I got three of them as we walked in. And so... Um, it's still proven to be one of the lesser um, turnouts of homework assignments far, so far to date. So 
We might give it an extra week. I'll give you some more time. I'll be like one of those lenient teachers that goes, okay, we'll grade on the curve. An extension. That's it. Yeah, we'll put an extension out on the due date. Um, <laughs> summer school. I like it. Um, <laughs> But I want us to be thinking of why it's important, okay? And I did not actually end up posting mine on the Mercy family page. I know some of you were looking for that. Um, and so I will read that for you tonight. But I want us to be thinking, though, of why it's important to know what you believe, okay? Even as I read mine tonight. So we will be able to ward off being deceived. That's the whole point, okay? Okay to be able to ward off being deceived. And we're going to get into some more things as we go along tonight, okay? And I was even talking to some of you tonight, like, I'm glad you're here tonight because guess what? This is going to fit with what you are going through tonight, okay? As only Holy Spirit can do, all right? So as you're thinking of I believe, these are some of the I believe statements that I wrote down. I believe in the creation of our world by the Godhead who were in existence before there was time. I believe in a plan for redemption before there were ever a people in need of redeeming. I believe in a father who gave, a son who submitted in obedience, and a Holy Spirit who confirmed and comforted all in the process. I believe each exists in equality and unity and yet each with individual characteristics and attributes. I believe in a mother of deep pondering and precious virginity who submitted herself to a plan higher than the one she had for her own life. I believe in a battle of good and evil, the likes of which has never been seen before or since, a dissension so strong only death could dissolve it. I believe in a gruesome whipping, a treacherous journey, and a grueling and unconscionable end to a life, the life of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. I believe in a restraint shown by angelic beings that defies logic and induces awe. I believe in a descending of the holy into the pits pits of depravity, followed by a display of authority that ensured access to an eternal glory. I believe in a resurrection of life that resulted in a resurrection of hope for those found hopeless in the clutches of transgression, unrighteousness, and damnation. I believe in a victory over the grave which was a catalyst for the gospel of grace. I believe in the truth of the word of God, truth that stands the test of time. Truth that remains pure when attempted to be watered down, remains stiff when attempted to be softened, and remains life-giving when tried to be proven dead. I believe the scriptures within that book of truth contain every resource needed for humanity to live in eternity. Every teaching required to obtain salvation through sacrifice, blemishes, removed through blood, victory through veil tearing, purpose through penitence, honor through humility, and life through death. What a great dichotomy. I believe in the kingdom of God. I believe in the promise of a home for me there, and I believe that I will make it to that home. Do you believe the same? Yeah. Amen. Do you believe that? When you write those I believe statements, when you heard the Apostles' Creed last week, when you read in Scripture, can you take that and personalize it and go, I believe that. I believe that for me. Not just, yeah, I believe that for them. I believe that for someone better than myself. I believe that for the good ones, but can you say, I believe that for me? And if you gave an affirmative answer tonight, or even if you had trouble giving one, then we're going to head into the message title for tonight, which is called Grounded in Your Beliefs. 
And Paul's words to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 through 14 are going to be the springboard that we're going to use as we go into the message tonight. They're going to sound familiar to you because we read them last week, but they're going to be what we bounce off of or the springboard that we use to dive in, right? Because what are we going into? We're grounded in our beliefs. We're diving deeper into them, okay? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 through 14, at the end of 11, he says, This gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That's what Paul is. And he says, That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What you have heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Hmm. That is powerful. And Paul puts it so well to Timothy there, doesn't he? To know what he believes. He's telling Timothy, know what you believe and guard what you believe. And no matter what you have to go through for the sake of it, Timothy, it's going to be worth it. And that's what I tell each of you here tonight. And I will say it until my dying breath. It's worth what you have to go through. We're going to touch on three people from scripture as we look at the importance of being grounded in our beliefs, not only in the area of of scripture, but grounded in our beliefs about God and about his nature and not just about his nature to everybody else, but about his nature toward us as well. So that when hard times come and when trials manifest and when the enemy presses in hard, that we can draw from the strength that comes from the God that we already know. So much easier to draw strength from what you already know than to be trying to learn it and figure it out in the process of going through it. So if you're not already going through, now's a really good time to learn it. And if you are going through, hopefully you already know something that you can grab hold of. And if not, grab a hold of somebody that does know it and let us help you. Amen? All right. So the first one that we're just going to touch on quickly is Jeremiah. Hmm. Now, Jeremiah... He was known before he was even knit in his mother's womb, God told him. Like before I knew you, before you were even knit in your mother's womb. Like, Jeremiah, come on. I already knew you. I already called you as a prophet before the nations. Like, you weren't even like a twinkle in your daddy's eye yet. And I had already done this. Like, I already knew you. And he had called him from his very youth. Like he's young. And he goes, you're going to stand before like kings of nations. And you're going to tell them what I have to say. And Jeremiah's like, me? Like, I'm just a boy. I'm just young, right? And he was used as a mighty prophet among God's people. And yet he had such... Times of being tossed from mountaintop to valley low all throughout his life. Because guess what? He didn't have an easy one. It's not like, I've been called from before I was knit in my mama's womb. Like, God's favor is resting all over me. Like, this is going to be the greatest life ever. It's just going to be smooth sailing. (laughs) That is not how this life goes not for us and definitely not for Jeremiah or any of the prophets that I can think of off the top of my head okay and we've spoken on this one before so I'm not going to spend very much time with it but 
I'm especially going to take us just to chapter 20, just for a second. You know, we love that scripture that says, like a fire shut up in my bones. I could not contain it. And I'm like, yeah, that's how I feel. Like, I can so relate, Jeremiah. Yeah. You know why he said that? Because life was really hard and nobody was listening to him. And he had done decided that he wasn't going to speak anymore. And he said, I'm done. You can find somebody else to speak your words to these people because they're hard-headed and they're stiff-necked and they're stupid, and I'm done. And I ain't going to speak to them anymore, so you're just going to have to find a different guy. I'm done. And then he says, but it was like a fire shut up in my bones and I couldn't contain it. See what happens when we just take one little verse and we go, oh, that's going to be my life verse and I'm going to tattoo it on my arm and I'm going to live by that verse. And, but we don't get like the context of it. It's because like it was rough to be Jeremiah. Same chapter, we move down to chapter 13. He's all excited again. And he's going, sing to the Lord, give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy in the hands of the wicked. He's happy again. Like, this guy is like a roller coaster. I like roller coasters, but I don't like living them. I just like riding them, right? This dude is a roller coaster. I ain't never going to talk anything you say to me again. Never mind, it's like a fire. I can't contain it. Ah, oh. verse 13, sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, give praise to the Lord. He rescues everybody. Da, da, da. Look at verse 14, like literally the next verse, guys. Curse the day I was born. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. Where's the next one? The very next verse. Cursed be the man who brought my father the news. Who made him very glad by saying, a child is born to you, a son. Like, (laughs) cursed be the day, cursed be the man, curse it all, just curse, 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 because my life sucks. This is the prophet of God? (laughs) To the nations, from his youth, known before he was even knit together in his mother's womb, who had the fire shut up in his bones like six verses before this? Really? Mountain high, valley low, back and forth, verse by verse by verse. How important do you think it is that we be grounded in our beliefs? Why? Because guess what life will do to you? Mountain high, valley low, mountain high, valley low. Even if you have a call of God on your life, even if you've walked in that call of God, Even if you've been faithful to that call of God, mountain high, valley low, mountain high, valley low. Guess what? Everything that comes out of your mouth, it's not always going to be, blessed be the name of the Lord. Sometimes you're going to say, cursed be the day that my mama ever had me and that the guy ever came out and said, you had a son. Hmm. Hmm. That's what Jeremiah wrote. He was a prophet of God. Wow. Confusion falls on him, right? He's just completely wrecked. And why? Do we fault him for it? He's imprisoned, okay? And he starts going, I don't know, God, like, did you forsake me here? He literally wants to die. He sounds, like, kind of dramatic. And we're going to get into, like, It gets a little dramatic sometimes, okay? But it's where he's at. It's where he's at physically. He's in prison. It's where he's at emotionally. Like valley low. That's in our emotions sometimes, right? It's where he's at spiritually. And I want you to hear this, though. Is that God will not bring things upon us, but he will allow us to go through them. And he will not abandon us in them, though. Never. I was just able to pray with a sister during worship tonight. And I said, this day didn't take God by surprise. He was already here before you got here. He was in this day before you got to this day. You got news today that you didn't know you were going to get, but God knew you were going to get it. 
And God was already in this day waiting for you to get to this day, to get this news today. He was already waiting for you to get to this day. And he was already ready. And when you got to this day, he was already here to wrap you up in it. And it didn't take him by surprise. And he's not going to leave you. And he's going to carry you through each day after this. Because those ones don't take him by surprise either. And he's never going to leave you. He's not going to abandon us in them. And I want us to listen to this. He never leaves us or forsakes us. It's in Deuteronomy 31.6, and it's as much for us now as it was for then. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. Fill in whoever you want to for them. Put a situation, put a diagnosis, put a test result, put a person, put an event, put somebody's name, put a death, put grief, put whatever. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord, your God, goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. It's truth. Know what you believe and be grounded in that belief because there's going to be mountain high and valley low days and you have to be able to grab it and hold on to it with everything you know because that same God up here is the same God here and he was waiting for you to get here because he knew that this day was going to someday bring you here just as much as you were going to be here again later. He knew Jeremiah in verse 9 was going to be in verse 13 and in verse 14 and 15. And he knew it'd be everywhere else, 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you. On every graduation card ever, that's not what Jeremiah was thinking of. It was high schoolers graduating high school, okay? But when we become the focus of the enemy, I want you to listen to this, and the fiery darts of the evil one are whizzing by our head, and they're coming in rapid succession, we are to take up our shield of faith, just like Paul tells us in Ephesians 6.16, and it tells us it's to extinguish all the fiery darts of the enemy, right? Yes. Okay, we're done with Jeremiah now. Okay, put him away. Now, I know. Got to move on. Next. We, what's that? Okay, we're ne- never mind. Uh. <laughs> Next, we haven't talked to, about him since uh, Christmas Eve. JTB, do we know who he is? John the Baptist. Okay, Matthew chapter 11. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist. Wow, what a life. Everything that was asked of him, he did it, right? And then here he is. Try to figure out if this is mountain high or valley low for John the Baptist. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? That's a sad question. Imagine the state he's in. Like if you can try to put yourself in John the Baptist's shoes, you almost can't read Matthew chapter 11, verse 4, and not weep. He's the forerunner of Jesus. He's the one that had such humility that it was nothing for him to be able to go, there he is. Here he comes. He had such a huge following. Droves of people just followed him. Have we ever watched Forrest Gump? Anybody ever watch a movie? Remember when he starts running and then he just keeps running and then he just keeps running and then like he's like hairy man. And he's still running, and all these people are just following him. Okay, that's John the Baptist. He's like hairy man. He's eaten locusts and wild honey. He's dressed in camel's hair. He's like not your typical dude. Okay, living out in the wilderness, 
And people just follow him by the droves. And what did it say? He asked, he sent his disciples. That's not a capital H. He had his own disciples. He had his own followers, okay? And he has these droves of people following him, and he's baptizing people, and he's telling people about this one that's going to come and all that. And he lays it all down, and he's able to go, there he is. Here comes the Messiah, the one that I'm not even worthy to unlatch his sandals. And he's able to just, in sheer humility, lay it all down and point to Christ and go, here he is. Here's the one. Here he is. He's coming. This is the moment we've been waiting for, guys. Like, this is John the Baptist. This is who he is and what he believes and the faith that's in him and his whole life from the time he was in his mama's womb, filled with the Holy Spirit, leaping at the news that Mary is with child. This is him. And now talk about Valley Low. Verse 4, he's in prison, and he sends some of his disciples to go and ask Jesus, like, just just ask him, are you you really the one? Are are you really Messiah, or or should we expect another? Like, I've already pointed you out. I've already pointed the people towards you. I've already said you're the one, but maybe it'll do something to you when you're sitting in prison and, and when the enemy starts chirping his soury sound bites in your ear, and and he goes, eh, I don't know. Verse 4, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect another? And here's Jesus. Verse, sorry, that was verse 3. Verse 4, Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. Just give him a testimony. Just, just go back and give them a testimony, guys. Verse 5, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Verse 6, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Guess what? There's going to be times in Valley Low we might question. really the one this all sounds a little crazy sometimes I just need a word I just need a sign I just I I don't know forgive me I just need something it's getting a little hard and guess what Jesus didn't rebuke him actually He goes on to speak about how John the Baptist is the one who fulfilled the prophecy of Malachi 3.1 of being the messenger sent ahead of him to prepare the way. And that he says, of all women... He, of, born of all women, there had been none that was greater than John the Baptist. So he doesn't scold him, and he doesn't bring a word of rebuke to him. And guess what? There were a lot of people listening when this word is asked of Jesus. And guess what? He doesn't even bring a word of rebuke about him. Instead, he sends a word of encouragement and he sends a word of testimony of the great work that's being done on behalf of the kingdom. And then he gives a strong word and an accolade about John the Baptist to all of those who are listening also. And so now I'm going to ask you a question. Do you do the same thing when someone struggles in their faith? Hmm. When you hear about someone struggling in their faith, maybe they're not in church. And maybe they can't bring themselves to come right now because they're struggling in their faith. And and maybe they need a word of testimony and encouragement sent out to them. And maybe you send that word of encouragement out, but then what do you say to all the other ones who are listening in? Do you speak highly of them? And do you say, oh, this one, this one, this one that I just sent this word of encouragement to, you know all the amazing things they've done for the kingdom? 
Do you know the last time they were in service, I saw them giving a word of encouragement to someone else, or I saw them hold the door for someone, or I saw them give a piece of candy to a young child that was here, or do you know they taught in, in their younger days in church, and, and now they're just home and they can't make it here, and, and we just sent them a word of encouragement today. Is that how we talk of them when they're not in earshot? Of what we can say? It's how Jesus talked about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was literally questioning the validity of if Jesus was the Messiah. And it was heard by people around him. And Jesus didn't rebuke him, sends a word of testimony and encouragement, and then speaks highly of John to those that are listening. Ooh. Okay, I'll let you catch your breath for a second. Because I know I just like punched you right there where it like takes the wind out of you. So everybody take, take a deep breath. I'll take a drink. And we'll move on. Okay, our last one for this evening, but don't get excited. We're not almost done. Because this is the longest one. This is Elijah. Hmm. I don't know if I've ever preached about Elijah ever. I don't think. Elijah is a great man of God, okay? He has prayed that there would be no land, no land, there would be no rain in the land, and it hasn't rained for three years. So now there is this great famine, okay? In 1 King chapter 18, he has asked for a meeting with King Ahab, okay? And he calls for all the prophets of Baal, there are 400 of them, And he calls for all the prophets of Asherah, there are 450 of them, to be joined together and to come and to meet on Mount Carmel. Okay, so there are 850 false prophets all joined here. Okay, and he has two altars built, one to God Almighty, Jehovah, and one to Baal, okay, And it's just the greatest story ever, but we don't have time to really go into all of it. But he waits for them to call down fire from heaven, and he he gets snarky. I absolutely love it. He's like, hey, what's wrong with your God? Like, maybe he's deaf. I don't know. Maybe he can't see you. Maybe he's busy and he's using the bathroom. We'll just wait a minute. Like, he literally, like, gets really, really sarcastic with them. It's the best thing ever. And then, like... Yes, and nothing happens, obviously. And so then he goes, okay, well, I'm going to call fire down from heaven on this sacrifice, but first let's get 12 buckets of water and let's pour it all over everything and let's just douse everything in water and let's dig a trench and let's fill the trench with water and let's do all of that. And then we're going to call fire down from heaven and the fire consumes the sacrifice, the altar, all the water, licks up all the water, like consumes all of it because God is just blow my mind amazing, right? And so Elijah... And the men then go and kill all 850 false prophets of Baal and Asherah. Like, oh, yeah, go God, right? Like, awesome stuff. Mountaintop experience. Not just because they're on Mount Carmel, but like mountaintop experience, right? And you would think that after seeing that and after being used in that, that you'd like be on cloud nine for, well, like forever, Right? Like, look what we saw God do. But not so. Because Jezebel. Everybody say, because Jezebel. Because Jezebel. (laughs) There are so many times in your life that you could be like, yeah, but because Jezebel. (laughs) Okay? I'm just waiting for like, somebody needs to do a whole message on because Jezebel. That'd be a good one. But Jezebel, okay, here's this news from King Ahab. She is stinking mad, and she comes after Elijah, and she threatens him, and she makes a pact to kill him by the same time the next day, and guess what Elijah does? Yeah. (laughs) Like, him and his men have just killed 850 false prophets of Baal, but he's scared of this woman. Smart man. No. (laughs) 
This man is godly. He is righteous. He is holy. He is a man filled with the power of God. He's a man that has been given direction by God on so many occasions. He is filled with an anointing and a passion that like pales in comparison to so many, to any contemporary around him. Okay, he is one of like the major prophets in the Bible. Um, he's a man who walks in close communion with God and he's in his will and this is a man who is like grounded in his beliefs, just like the title of our message tonight. But it's one thing to fight like a corporate battle when you can take the army and you can go down and you can slaughter the 850 false prophets of Baal and Asherah. And it's this widespread corporate battle, like what he had just done. And it's something, <coughs> excuse me completely different when it becomes personal. And that's what it was. Now, with Elijah, it's personal. Elijah had done the widespread corporate thing. He'd had the whole army go with him. He'd slayed all the false prophet. All is well and good when you have an army fighting by your side. But what about when it gets personal? Jezebel, possessed by hell itself, made it personal. And that's the thing about the enemy of our souls that I want us to understand, is he is not afraid to make it personal. And he will get in as close as he can, and he will make it as personal as he can, and he will get you where it hurts as hard as he can. And he will show no mercy. And he will give you no grace because he doesn't have any. So when we take a stance as a follower of Christ and we lay hold of the inheritance that's stored up for us in heaven that will not perish, spoil, or fade... And we make conquests and we take stances in our belief that we will live our lives for Christ and, and this life that he gave his for, the enemy then starts to make it personal. And he wants to then begin to wear away at you and to fill you with unbelief and to wear away at you with these little pieces of doubt and if he can just weasel his way in with some fear and some worry and get some anxiety in the cracks, maybe some angst, maybe put a little bit of strife in your home, he knows that when we're in the word and when we're living by faith and not by sight, right, it's then that we're steady and that we're grounded and then that we have our shield of faith up and we're like wielding our sword and, and we're quoting scripture back to him. It is also written and yeah, right? Ain't nothing going to get me. But what happens when he starts weaseling his way in there and he starts making it personal? So he does all that he can to make the battle personal and to cause us to begin to despair. So here is Elijah. Should have been on cloud nine for like ever. But he's running, literally running for his life. But guess what? God is still with us when we're running. Huh. And while Elijah's running... He gets to this juniper tree, and then he's tired. Here we are with Forrest Gump again. Like, one day he just quits running, right? He's just done. I got tired. So Elijah's just done running, okay? And he sits under this juniper tree, and he's just wore out. And I don't know if we've seen the little funny meme on Facebook, and it says, you know, one day Elijah wanted to die, and God was like, here, eat some food and take a nap, and he was all better. Yeah. Like, sometimes all we need to do is eat some food and take a nap, and things will get better. Okay, it's, it's usually so much bigger than that, but sometimes eat some food and take a nap. But guess what God does? First, he sends an angel to minister to him, to feed him with a food that gave a nourishment beyond what he could have gotten on his own, first of all, okay? And he'll minister to you and provide for you that same way, with a strength 
that you could have never gotten on your own. We sang about that tonight in the one song. I was going to write down the lyrics, and we didn't repeat that, the, the set of lyrics. I don't know what that song was tonight, but it was so good. I don't know, it was like the third one we did. But, wow, it so went along with this. Like a strength that we could never have on our own. That's the strength that he will give us. And he will speak to us. And that's what he did with Elijah. You know, I didn't pull out specific scriptures, but we're somewhere like chapter 19 here. Okay? And he basically asks Elijah, like, what are you doing? Like, why are you here? Why are you hiding? And, and he'll ask us those same questions. Like, what are you doing? Why are you hiding? Why are you closing up inside? Why are you going back to your default, to what you always do? This is what you always do. The enemy comes at you, and this is what you always do. You retreat within yourself. You clam up. You close off. You do the same thing over and over and over again. You start closing up inside. You start focusing on your problems. How long are you going to allow the enemy to keep you in this bondage? How long? How many times do we seek only a little reprieve or we feel only a little reprieve from it and we go, oh, okay, that's better. From what ails us? whether it's internal, whether it's physical, whether it's mental, whether it's something that we battle against all the time. Guess what? God's not just interested in giving us just a little bit of relief. Jesus didn't die on the cross just to, like, give us a little bit of relief or free us from just a little bit of our sin, that's not what he did. He didn't take stripes upon his back to make us like feel a little less achy, <laughs> but to heal us from all our diseases. That's what it tells us in scripture, right? Amen. To free us from all our sin. Yes. And are we grounded in our beliefs enough to know that? And then he will challenge us. And this is what he did. And this will be a challenge to those, especially those of you who are in leadership positions, okay? But it's for all of you as well, is it's one thing for you to have faith for a whole nation. Elijah had that. He had faith enough to pray and God to close up the heavens for three years. And it didn't rain in an entire land for three years. And there was a famine and he had enough faith for a whole nation, but he didn't have enough faith for himself in one moment. And he literally hides under a tree and in a cave, and he just asked God to take him out. Like he literally ran for his life and then asked God to just kill him. (laughs) And how many times is it like that for ourselves? And especially those of us who are overseers, we can have faith for the entire people group. But what about when we need faith just for ourselves or those within our own four walls? But even for all of us, oh, we could pray for everybody else. But what about when we need to touch ourselves? It's one thing to have faith for everybody else, and we can do that and reach out on behalf of them. But you have to get honest with God about all these things and then understand why we go through it. It's to make us stronger for the next battle and for the next one and for the next one so that we can be grounded even deeper in our beliefs and even deeper in our faith and we can walk in faith even stronger than we did the time before. Because why? We don't just preach theory, guys. We preach it because we live it and we live it out each and every day, right? And so Elijah does get out from under the juniper tree. He does get out from the cave. The Lord even shows himself to Elijah. It says he wasn't in the wind and he wasn't in the earthquake and he wasn't in all those things. And Elijah leaves that place. And God shows him. You know, Elijah even says, I've been faithful to you. I'm the only one left. Like I'm literally the only one left. All the other ones have been killed. And he goes, don't you worry about it. I'm going to take care of it all. 
I'm raising up these different ones, and they're going to kill and slay all these ones. And there's all these ones that did not bend their knee to Baal. I'm going to save those ones. And there were 7,000 left in the land that had not bent their knee to Baal. So if you ever think that you're the only one left, I'm the only one, God, I'm the only one left. Everybody else, they're bending their knee to the left and the right. No. They might be hiding in the caves, but they're there. And they haven't been bending their knee. And God has been protecting them just like he's been protecting you. And there's going to come a day where he's going to bring them all together for his purpose and his plan. And he's going to give a word. He'll bring us to the end of our own strength so that we have to depend on his own. Because how many of us try to do it in our own strength? And we learn that we can't and we rely on his. And then the next trial comes and we do it in our own strength. And then guess what? Jeffrey said something while he was talking up here during worship. And he goes, you know what? You weren't supposed to carry the heavy things it's for God to carry and I wrote it down because guess what I can't do right now physically I can't carry heavy things and I hate it and so that like made my ears perk up I'm not supposed to carry the heavy things and I don't have to but guess what it's not just in the physical it's in the spiritual things it's in our everyday life things we weren't meant to we weren't meant to carry these heavy things and he's going to bring us through all of these situations where we go you know what it's a little too heavy for me to carry it's all getting too much My shoulders are broad. I've always prided myself on being really strong. But you know what? It's too heavy for me right now. And God goes, finally. And then we have to rely on his strength, right? And it's not going to be physical food that he gives us that will be the nourishment that we need. It will be a meal that is set before us from the word of God that does so. And this is why I reiterate to you over and over and over again, the importance of knowing the word for ourselves. This is why I'm challenging you in these messages to not fall back on these statements of, I believe what the Bible says, or I believe what my pastor preaches, right? You guys hear me talk about my pastor, Uncle Jim. There was a time in his life towards his last couple of years where his eyes got so bad that he couldn't read his Bible anymore. And it was a very, very heartbreaking time for him when he couldn't just sit with scripture anymore and read it anymore. But you know what? He had read it for so long in his life that he had it so ingrained in here that he knew it and could recall it anyway. And so when he needed the secretary at church to make him notes for preaching, he could just say, Well, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 1 through 6, when John the Baptist is in prison and he asks Jesus, can you put those in my notes for service? And she could make them big to where he could read them. But he knew where it was and he knew what it was and why. Because he had spent his life dedicated to it and reading it. Well, if we all woke up tomorrow and for whatever reason we couldn't read it anymore, would we have it in here enough to be satisfied with how much we already had? I'm not. I'll stand and say that. I rely on my tablet and my laptop and my phone because I have every translation available to me that I could possibly need, and it's so easy. And But do I have enough of it in here? Would I be satisfied if all of a sudden I couldn't pull all of that up as quickly as I needed it? In Jude, chapter 1, verse 24 and 25, it's going to be our last scripture for this evening. I want us to think, when the enemy is trying to tell you, when he's chirping those sorry sound bites in your ear, and he's trying to tell you, you're going to lose it all, or you're just always going to battle with this thing, or you're always going to be depressed, or can't you tell you're about ready to lose a grip again, or this time won't be any different. It's going to be just like all the other times before. 
I want you to stay grounded in your beliefs. And I want you to tell the enemy to shut up with his lies because you serve the God who is able to keep you from stumbling. And this is Jude chapter 1, verse 24 and 25. To him who is able, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. So, if they want to come back up and sing for us, if you've been running 